the Catholic Church is much more of the opinion that just participating in the sacraments themselves, taking communion, or being baptized, or you know, the other sacraments of matrimony, or taking holy orders, or very, various others, that just by doing them, even if you aren't too sure about it, you do, you are a recipient of grace. There's actually, the Catholic Church, and, and they don't talk about this much, at least Protestants, and most Protestants don't understand this, the Catholic Church is of the opinion that there is a reservoir of grace which is the property of the Catholic Church. That when um, the saints, that is believers, die, those who have more grace than they need for their own salvation, like the great saints of the church, you know, the, the Mother Teresa's or the Pope's or whoever else, that when they die, their excess grace, quite literally, the grace that is greater than what they require for their own spiritual needs, becomes the property of the church. And the church can then dispense that from the reservoir of grace to those as they receive sacraments. This is also the, the theological principle, the Catholic theological principle, behind the dispensations that are granted, where people can be released from purgatory earlier or, you know, those kinds of things. Because extra grace can be administered by the church because they have a reservoir of grace because of the saints that have died with excess grace. I'm using all, I'm not using the proper Catholic theological terms in describing that because I, I think it's easier to understand, but that's basically the principle. So when, in the Catholic Church, when someone takes communion, or is baptized, or participates in confirmation, or holy orders, or matrimony, or any of those things, they are, at that moment, by the very act of doing that, ex opere operato, they are receiving the grace that the Catholic Church has the right to dispense. Okay? That is not what Protestants believe. We believe that grace, grace is received directly from God as we in faith respond to the truth of Jesus Christ. As we receive him, you know, Ephesians says, by grace you were saved through faith. And it is not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is the free gift of God, uh, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So free gift of God, by faith, not of works, we believe, and the Protestant reformers believe, clearly indicate that it is not the way of the Catholic Church. That's why we do not agree with that doctrine. That it is by the act or the work of participating in one of the sacraments that you receive grace and that it is given by the church by an action, which is a kind of works. So we disagree with that. But, that, and, and it's, I think it's important to understand some of those, that's why, because that's how you receive grace through the sacraments, why every Catholic Mass celebrates Eucharist or communion, the Lord's Supper. Because that's the point in the service, not by hearing God's word or having faith or expressing you know, our faith in prayer or anything else, but rather by receiving the, the sacrament, that's how you receive grace. And so that's why it's done every service. Okay, make sense? Yeah. Is that new to you? Okay, I'm getting yeses, noes. But, um, in addition, there, there are other understandings or definitions. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and Anglicans are Protestants, but actually a friend of mine who's an Anglican priest argues with me. He says they're not Protestants. I get, what the heck are you? You're not Catholic. Anglo-Catholics. Uh, what's that? Anglo-Catholics. Well, there are Anglo, Anglo-Catholics, a particular kind of Anglican. It's not the same thing. Anglo-Catholics are those who may be Anglican, but they, they have much more of the accoutrement of the Catholic Church. For instance, they would have a church that has the Stations of the Cross. Uh, Anglo-Catholics may even have a confessional, a booth. You know, so they, they, that's, that's a closer, much closer to being Catholic than most Anglicans. But the Anglican Church, the reason why it, it seems there's a little confusing is a um, little history in England. The children of Henry VIII, they, some of them, because Henry created Protestantism in, in England, but some of his children were influenced by Catholicism, some by Protestantism. His son, uh, Edward, who ruled for a short time, was very sick. He pushed the country toward Protestantism pretty rapidly. His sister Mary, who became queen, was very Catholic. And so she tried to suppress Protestantism. That's why she became known as Bloody Mary. And then later, Elizabeth took over. And Elizabeth was Protestant, but she recognized that they had been having all this war. And so she created the Anglican Church as we know it, which which the theology is Protestant. The Westminster Confession that the Anglican Church uses is the same one that, that most, a lot of the other Protestant churches, including Baptists and, and uh, Presbyterians and everything else. So theologically it's Protestant, but it looks like Catholic. 
the ceremonies look Catholic. And she did that in order to try to keep Catholics and Protestants from still fighting each other. And she was very successful. She was very wise. So it looks Catholic, but the theology behind it is Protestant, unless you get an Anglican who doesn't want to admit that they're Protestant, like my friend Annie. Um, so that, that's the difference. But the Anglican Book of Common Prayer defines sacrament this way. It is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. In fact, that definition, outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, is quite common amongst Protestants, not just Anglicans. Uh, of a spiritual grace given unto us, ordained by Christ himself as a means whereby we receive the same and a pledge to assure us thereof. So an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. The Orthodox Church tends to agree pretty closely with Catholic. That is, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, there's different kinds of Orthodox. Um, they would agree, except, uh, they would accept all seven of the sacraments that the Catholic Church has, but they would add more. Because they believe that anything that the Catholic Church does as an effort to seek holiness is a sacrament. They consider the making of icons as a focal point for worship as sacramental. They consider um, meditation and seeking after God as being sacramental. So anything, in fact, they don't use the word sacrament, they use the word mysterion, which is the Greek word that is the New Testament word that we have translated, usually get translated into sacrament. It literally means the mystery. But that's translated as sacrament in most cases in, in translation. Um, so they, and they can accept anything as being sacramental. It's interesting too, I mean, Kina, you attend a Baptist church. I don't know if anybody else has a Baptist background. They don't use the word sacrament at all. They use the word ordinance. That baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances. And the reason they did that primarily is the 19th century Oxford movement, which was really a, 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 a emphasis, a, what would I say, a revival of the Catholic movement in England, the Oxford movement. It's when, when um, Newman... John Henry Newman became Catholic from being Protestant and a lot of other. They created Catholic unions and universities, and the Catholic Church really had a revival in the 19th century. Well, they emphasized sacramental theology. Well, in reaction against that, hey, John, in reaction against that, the Baptists, who were present in England at that time, decided they didn't want to talk about sacraments at all, and so they called them ordinances, kind of in opposition to the Oxford revival movement. Um, now, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I said is the most common amongst Protestant churches of all of the confessions of faith. The Westminster Confession of Faith is also one of the longest because it has a shorter catechism, a longer catechism. Um, it is a fairly comprehensive document. It was created at Westminster in, in England, um, and so it is foundational both for the Anglican churches as well as for most Protestant churches. Because it was written, that's, it's the theological document that, Mar that uh, Elizabeth commissioned in order to articulate the Protestant theology that would be underneath the Anglican Church, but it's consistent with a lot of other churches. The, the Westminster Confession of Faith is found in the Presbyterian Book of Creeds, for instance. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith speaks of a number of different aspects of what should be part of Christian worship. It talks about the reading of scripture, of sound preaching as being ordinary parts of Christian worship, but also it talks about the due administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments. So sacraments have in every aspect of Christian worship, with a couple of very minor exceptions, always been perceived as being part of the worship service. In fact, nearly all Christians acknowledge that there are sacraments, although some call them ordinances, that are instituted by Christ and that these have a place in the worship of God's people. There are a few exceptions to that. The Salvation Army is a church, by the way, a lot of people don't know that first. The Salvation Army is actually a church, it's not just an organization. They do not practice the sacraments. And the reason, there are a number of reasons for that. Part of it is because they say we should, you know, we should focus more on the spiritual realities rather than the external uh, recognition of those things. Similarly, the Quakers uh, and some of the other kind of Mennonite movements, the Anabaptist movements, some of them don't practice sacraments either for the same reason, because they believe that that actually will, it will prevent us from having as much focus on the spiritual truths by exercising a physical, external kind of manifestation of it. It's not that they don't agree with the principle behind it, either one of those, either Salvation Army or, or the, um, 
the Anabaptist descendants, which is Mennonite, Brethren, um, etc. But they don't practice them because they feel it is a that it's emphasizing the wrong in the wrong way. Um, there is the word sacrament itself is extra biblical, meaning we don't find that word in the Bible. As I say, the word mysterion, which does appear in the Greek, gets translated into sacrament, which is because of the Latin Vulgate. It actually is based upon the word uh, sacer, which means holy, like sacerdotal. Um, and so it's a, it's a Greek root, but it was the, I'm sorry, a Latin root, but it's the Latin root that was translated from the Greek mysterion, or a mystery of the faith. The question, though, is, while most Christians, nearly all Christians, acknowledge that there are sacraments, holy actions, to represent grace that we're given, um, we have questions about how many sacraments. Most Protestants recognize two, even the Anglicans, who don't claim to be Protestants. I keep teasing my friend Danny about that. Um, they, so they say there are two, because they believe there are only two that were actually commanded by Christ. Jesus, when he... Um, the la at the Last Supper, on the night in which he was betrayed, is the way we say it when we do the words of institution, our Lord Jesus took the bread and said, "As you know, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. This idea of do this in remembrance of me is considered a command. And so we practice the Lord's Supper because of that. Similarly, Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, whoa, 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 you should be baptizing me. Jesus said, no. We need to do it this way right now so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. And then right after his resurrection, immediately prior to his ascension, Jesus said, go into all the world, making disciples, teaching them things I've taught you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he commanded us to go and make disciples and baptize people. Those two were commanded by Jesus. And that's why Protestant churches believe there are those two sacraments. Now, um, there's also a question of how are they administered and by whom are they administered? Can just anybody administer a sacrament? What if, um, a question the church had had for a long time is, if a priest perhaps is not himself, in the Catholic Church, is not himself worthy for some reason, maybe he's committed a, you know, a sin, then are the sacraments that he offers, if he then serves communion, is that somehow not effective because he's not right? And the Catholic Church decided no. That's one of the applications of ex opere operato. Doesn't matter who's offering it, the very act of receiving it um, is sufficient. It's efficacious, we would say. It accomplishes the goal. Um, to what extent do you have to have the administration of the sacraments in order to have a true church? Are this, is the Salvation Army and the Quakers, are they wrong? Are they not really a Christian church if they don't offer the sacraments? All of those are questions that get raised. And again, most Protestant churches have two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, or communion, as it's most commonly called amongst Baptist churches and some others, or the Eucharist in the higher churches, which means the Thanksgiving. And those are kind of the three levels of formality. The more formal liturgical churches will call it the Eucharist. The lower um, formal, less formal churches, least formal churches, will call it communion. The ones in the middle will often speak of the Lord's Supper. Okay. Um, Roman Catholicism has seven sacraments. They include the same as Protestants, baptism and the Lord's Supper, but they add penance, <coughs> confirmation, marriage, holy orders, and final unction, or as since Second Vatican, uh, extreme unction or final unction has been changed to be called anointing of the sick. They get them a different title. Um, extreme unction typically was only done to someone who was dying right at the point of death. Uh, and so now they, they've identified that in the same way you do that for a dying person, you can anoint the sick at any time. And that's the sacrament, actually. So penance is actions that are taken for um, in, because of sin, for repentance of sin. Confirmation is uh, while children are baptized as infants, when they reach the point of accountability and they declare themselves to be, have made the decision of belief, they are confirmed in the church. That's a sacrament in the Catholic and Anglican, in the uh, um, Orthodox churches. And in some cases, confirmation isn't necessarily because the child has decided they're ready, but it happens at a certain time. You know, it's the first communion happens at a certain age or a certain date, so it's been formalized in those ways, but that's a sacrament. 
marriage is a sacrament. And this is one of the ones where the Protestant, starting with the Protestant Reformers. The Protestant Reformers looked at this and went, when and where did Jesus get married or order us to get married? You know, where do you get that? Paul, in fact, encouraged people not to get married if they could, if they could help it. He said, it's great, it's fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but I would rather you be like me, and that is not be married. But if, if you can't control yourself, better to be married. Um, holy orders, which means becoming a priest or a monk or a nun, taking on an official role in the church. And then, as I said, the anointing of the sick or extreme unction or final unction. It used to simply, that used to entirely be focused upon those who were dying, uh, but later on, since Vatican II has been entirely about anybody who's sick. Now, there has been a lot of abuse of these things, and I'll get into that. Particularly, one of the reasons why the Protestant Reformation happened was because of perceptions about the Catholic abuses of this, and, in, and some other things as well. For instance, the, um, the, the idea of being able to pay and get a special dispensation that would get you or a relative or somebody else out of purgatory earlier, was related to the sacraments because it had to do with the administration of grace or the availability of grace and what you had to do to get it, even though it might not have been particularly one of these. It could be seen as a kind of penance. In that regard, it would be considered a Catholic part of the Catholic sacrament. That was one of the things that really pushed Martin Luther over the edge. Now, Luther did not want, he did not plan or desire to leave the Catholic Church. He was just trying to get the Catholic Church to clean up their act. But the selling of these dispensations is one of the things that really set him off and led to the whole Protestant Reformation. Various in the Catholic, or I'm sorry, in the Protestant traditions, um, the Catholic leading up to that, the sort of more Protestant leaning Catholics, like Peter Lombard in the 12th century, called a sacrament a sign of a sacred thing. Which means there were people even earlier on that did not have as much of a sense that you actually were receiving grace when you received the sacrament, but rather that it was only a sign or a symbol of something else that was happening that was sacred. John Calvin, um, who did more to articulate the theology of the sacraments from a Protestant point of view than anybody, even Luther, wrote that a sacrament was, and I quote, an outward sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences the promises of his goodwill toward us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. We are strengthened by participation in this. Um, so, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of some of the differences in these as we go along. There are four elements of sacraments. And again, all of this is in the context of how much we use this in, in worship. I am actually... Um, you remember I talked last week about there being three sort of modern streams of worship uh, uh, association, those that were very much inclined toward being um, con communicating with and relating to the popular culture. And they tend to be more music oriented. That, those are the seeker churches and the sort of uh, non-denominational non Bible churches and that kind of thing. Then there are kind of middle of the road, those that both uh, honor and want to honor and respect in, in the historic traditions of worship but also are concerned about reaching out to people. Uh, they are more word-oriented, the reading of scripture and the preaching of the word. And then, on the high, the more formal end of the spectrum, there are those who really are not as concerned about being able to relate to or, or be perceived as relevant by the popular culture, but are much more oriented toward the historic traditions. Those are the three streams. And they are much more table-oriented or Eucharist-oriented. In other words, they're the ones, Anglicans being an example of that, that are, that will have, they have the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist at every service. I mean, at every main corporate worship service, they might have lesser services that they don't do it at, in the same way the Catholics do, because they're very table-oriented. So, as we talk about these sacraments, my concern is that we realize that these have always been, to a greater or lesser extent, but they've always been very important to worship. This is where the sacraments happen. Children are baptized as part of the worship service. The Eucharist or Lord's Supper, communion, is offered as part of the worship service. And in many ways, these have been seen, or in many, in many parts of the church, these have been seen as the most important part. Whether you think, as the Catholic Church does, that you actually are receiving grace by taking the sacrament, or whether you simply think, say that this is a very powerful sign, an, an external sign of an inward grace uh, and spiritual thing that's happening, um, this is important. 
Those who take it too lightly, I don't think you're on the right track. I've often mentioned my friend who said I can have communion with a hot dog and a Coke and a park just as easily. Well, when, you, when you're that cavalier about it, when you don't take it any more seriously than that, then there's a problem because this has always been seen as a big deal, whether you think it literally administers grace or it simply affirms the grace that we receive in faith. Okay? There are four elements, basic elements, as part of a sacrament. I'm going to talk about these. The first is that the sacraments are divine ordinances, that is, they were instituted and commanded by Christ himself. As I said, when Jesus said um, at the, the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me, and that's the indication that we are to take the, the bread and the cup as symbols of his body and blood. Now I say symbols, we'll talk in a minute about, there are three different ways to interpret that. There's three ways to interpret everything. Uh, and then, then, then it, right before his ascension, Jesus said, Go into all nations, making disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So it's believed that those two things were commanded. And Protestants look at the other five sacraments and go, Where exactly did Jesus command us to get married, or to become monks, or nuns, or priests, or to, you know, to anoint people right before they die, or any of the rest of that stuff? Where is that again? Um... So that's one of the reasons the Protestants decide those are not. They were not instituted by Christ, and so they are not included in the sacraments. There are a lot of other things that we're told to do, uh, and that are good to do, and that the church has always done. For instance, Jesus told us to pray, but he didn't command us in the same way. You know, he doesn't say, you know, every time you gather, pray. Prayer as a relationship with God is something that is certainly encouraged, but it's not commanded in the same way. It's not instituted as a unique uh, kind of element in our worship. Singing. The early church sang hymns. I mean, the early church, all the way back to David, sang hymns. But we are not commanded to sing hymns. The sacraments are considered mandatory. You need to do these things. They, they are, again, whether you think that they are themselves the source of grace or whether they only represent that, Jesus told us to do them. He didn't say, you know, if you feel like it, you might want to think about getting baptized or baptizing somebody else, or if it's not too much trouble, you might want to take communion. He told us to do it, and we have to do it. Now, there are very few other things that Jesus commanded us to do. There is one, and I confess to you some, some confusion on this one. Jesus, when he washed the feet of the disciples, he said, just as I've done this for you, do it for each other. And I've always read that and said, it sounds to me like he's telling us we should do that. And yet, very, very few churches wash each other's feet. And I don't know why that is. Other than it's a little bit more embarrassing. Okay. Well, in Guadalajara, uh, there's a Mennonite church, and they do it. Okay. But they do it uh, separate, they separate men and women. And, uh, like, men go, or women go upstairs and... You know, they separately do it. Right. And they're... Because, I mean, seeing a woman's feet, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they, all, they have to wear socks. Um, well, and I've, I've known of churches that say, well, we're going to do foot washing. And what they do is they, they take a Kleenex and they sort of wipe somebody's shoe. And I'm going, that's not washing feet. You know? No. That's polishing shoes. That's a completely different thing. So, yeah. Yes. Um, I, and I've never understood that because Jesus very clearly says, in any translation you want to get, I've done this for you, do the same thing for each other. And we translate it metaphorically and say, well, he means serve each other and everything else. Well, we can metaphorize baptism or, or uh, communion, eats too. And I, I'm sure that if I had to do the foot washing, I'd have a rebellion on my hand. But mm -hmm. it's something that I've never quite understood that because it seemed to me like he ordered this to. Yes, ma'am. Did that part of scripture not happen when... Martha and Mary were having a sisterly debate about... No, it happened in the Last Supper, you know, that Jesus right. okay. Jesus yeah. gets up. So he's um, showing true humility and... Right, and they were, not, they were not serving each other. In fact, they were still arguing about who gets to sit closest to him and who's going to be first in the kingdom, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus' example of them was to get up and to, you know tuck his robe in and wrap a towel around his waist and literally get down and wash the feet. And Jesus, uh, Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet because servants washed your feet when you came into a home. And, and Jesus said, Peter, if I don't 
wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And then he said, wow, wash my head and everything else too then. And Peter said, a man who's had a bath doesn't need to have another bath. You know, uh, we're just talking about feet here. Because, and the reason why that was the custom is because they wore sandals and they walked in dusty roads where there were animal waste and all kinds of stuff. And so washing the feet was considered not only a, a polite thing, but a sanitary thing to do when you entered somebody's home. And they had not done any of that for each other. And so Jesus, and when he finished, he said, done this for you and now you should do it for each other. So, we may become a foot washing church. I don't know yet. Yes? I've been involved in foot washing before. I mean, it's not as a common thing, but it's an extremely humbling yep. event. Not just for the person washing the feet, but for getting your feet washed. Yeah, I mean, sure. it's a really... I mean, I don't know if you did it every week, it would be so meaningful, but if, that from time to time, it, I found it to be very yeah. moving and you know, spiritual. Yep. Really yeah, I've, I've told you all along that part of the reason for teaching this class is I really am thinking and praying about things for our particular church, and so we'll see. Um, so, anyway, there, it, but these sacraments are the things that Jesus commanded us to do, not just the things that are a good idea or that he suggested or he said you should pray or you should do these things. He said do it with regard to sacraments. That's one. Second point is that the sacraments are ordinances in which there are material elements used as visible signs of God's blessing. Right? For instance, when we pray or when we sing songs or whatever, there's no, there's no physical symbols that we use in that. In baptism, obviously, the sign is water. And we talk about the fact that the water becomes a symbol of Jesus being submerged in the grave and then being resurrected again. Right? So that there's a very particular symbolism that the water provides for us. In the case of the Lord's Supper, the signs are two. One, the bread that signifies the broken body of the Lord Jesus, and wine which signifies his shed blood. So this idea that, that within the sacraments there are physical elements which we acknowledge, we actually do words of institution to bless them as being symbols of the, the significant aspects, physical manifestations of the grace. Now, in those cases, the sign, the physical thing, is secondary. It is what is internal. You know, it's the the outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace. So it's what's going on inside that's important. The reality that's primary is the inward and visible part. But we use visible elements to represent that. That's one of the main characteristics. Um, it's important to note, and I'll talk about this again, that neither baptism nor the Lord's Supper either make you or keep you a Christian. Now this... We've struggled with this. Guillermo and I are having conversations about baptism almost every day now <laughs> because there is a tendency, that the, the fact that the Catholic Church has a very different theology about the sacraments, you know, that, about that you do have to be baptized to be saved. And some others, I mean, there are some Baptists that believe that. I was saved in the Southern Baptist Church. And I honestly believe I made a profession of faith on Sunday night. I got baptized the next Sunday morning. And I know that if I'd been killed in a car accident on Wednesday night before I got back from being baptized, there would be people in the church that said, oh, he came so close. <laughs> so there are not just Catholics, there are others who believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. And in fact, that taking communion is necessary for salvation. We've struggled since we started as a church. There would be Catholic parents, especially mothers, who would show up with their baby. They don't come to our church. They don't plan to go to our church. But just to make sure that they covered all the options, they would want, and our, I dealt with this with Arturo on several occasions, they would come to Arturo and say, would you baptize my baby? And, and the question that I told them to always ask them is, why do you want them to be baptized? And the answer of, in one form or another was always, so that I know that they're okay. So this idea that the sacraments somehow are magic is not the case. I mean, we use these external symbols to, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more in a minute, but we need to make sure that we understand that so we use an external symbols, and these, these ceremonies are very important to us. Baptizing does not save a person. Taking communion uh, periodically does not keep a person a Christian. All right? They are not replacements for the internal act of faith that we have. And yet a lot of people tend to believe that. It's interesting that these external signs, signs are often used in our world as um, symbols of ownership. You know, you put a sign on something, property of, blah, blah, blah. In one way, we could almost say that the signs that we use of the material things are signs of 
our being the property of Jesus Christ, that he, we are committing ourselves to his ownership. We are identified with him at that point. Um, and that, I think, is very important for us to understand using these signs. The third is that the sacraments are means of grace to the one who rightly partakes of them. But our faith in the saving work of Christ is our means of salvation. And again, this, this is the same issue that some people believe that being baptized, taking communion is what saves you. And that if you don't participate in those things, you can't receive grace. And if you don't receive grace, you can't be saved. That is not biblical. That is not what we believe. We believe that we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ, but at the same time, you know, and we receive grace because of that faith, grace unto salvation. But still, if we approach the sacraments with faith, believing in the truth behind them, which is what it means by rightly partaking, then we actually can receive them as a means of grace, not the only means of grace but as a means of receiving His grace, because for the very simple fact that they are, at that point, we are able to exercise our faith in a particular way. And therefore, they become a means by which we receive great grace, okay? Now, in fact, in the words of institution, you know, we finish them by saying, um, and as much as you eat this bread and drink this wine in faith, you celebrate Him until He comes again. So it's the issue of in faith that makes the difference. But if we do come to them rightly, we accept in faith, then we can receive grace through that process because it's where we express our faith. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Is everybody okay? I feel like I'm losing some of you. Um, but the, the sacramental elements are not medicine. You don't take them and then you're all, you know, you've, we've dispensed like medicine, we've dispensed grace. That's not the perception. That's not how we understand it. Um, baptism is a means of grace and it conveys blessing because it certifies us as being a recipient of God's grace. The Lord's Supper, similarly, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, it represents what is continuously being wrought in us as we are servants of and we have faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, in fact, when we talk about as a means of grace, and that it's how we come to those sacraments, especially communion, when we talk about that, um, the, there are different ways of understanding what happens, particularly because there are different ways of understanding the presence of Christ in these elements. The Catholic Church believes that at the moment of the words of institution, the bread literally becomes the body of Christ. And the wine, the cup, literally, not just figuratively, not symbolically, it literally becomes the blood of Christ. This is called the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the substance of the bread and the wine are literally changed, even though you can't perceive the difference. And in fact, if you've ever been in a Catholic service, there is a point in the Catholic service where, after the words of institution, the priest will elevate the bread, and you will hear a bell in the background. Oh. That is, the sound of that bell or gong will be the instant at which that stops being bred in the Catholic belief and becomes the body of Christ. Same thing, words of institution, he elevates the cup. And when he elevates the cup, you will hear in the background, dong, or ding. That instant is when that's supposed to become the blood of Christ. Again, that's the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is one belief about the nature of the presence of Christ in the elements. That's also why the Catholic belief is that the Mass is a re-sacrificing of Jesus. The way you end up getting his body and blood for people to partake in is because you have re-sacrificed him. That is not the Protestant doctrine. The sacrifice of Christ, we believe, was once for all. And we believe that's very scriptural. So that's one view, transubstantiation. On the other end of the spectrum, starting with Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland, is the idea that the, the presence of Christ is not really there. That Jesus is not present any more than he is always present any time we believe in him. But rather that it is a memorial, that these are only symbols, that there is no real presence of Christ there. That's the other extreme. And the middle, the middle way, which is the, Re the Protestant reformers other than Zwingli and the Anabaptists, who went that way, the belief of Martin Luther, and of John Calvin, Calvin articulated more about this than anybody else, is that 
while the physical presence of Jesus is not there, this does not change into his literal body and blood like the Catholics believe, the real spiritual presence is there. In fact, Calvin wrote about it being the real presence, real in the sense that spiritual is more real than physical. That if we come rightly, if we take it rightly, meaning we come in full faith to these elements, then they take on for us the spiritual significance. The real presence spiritually of Christ is there in them. In fact, a word that, was, that I really like that we used in seminary is transsignification. Not transubstantiation, meaning the substance changes, but transsignification, which means the, sub, the uh, significance changes. It's no longer just bread and the cup. Literally, that's what it still is. But it takes on the significance of being the real presence of Christ in body and blood when we take it in faith. That's the middle road. That's what Calvin advocated. Now, Luther was schizophrenic about this. Luther did not believe in transubstantiation, meaning it wasn't literally changed. But he also, and he absolutely could not agree with the symbol, the memorial idea of Zwingli. In fact, Zwingli and Luther and some of the other Protestants got together at one point early on in the Reformation and said, can we get together? And they had like 26 points that they, they were talking about that they might disagree on. And they agreed on all of them except the nature of the presence of Christ in the communion. And the story is, whether it's true or not, that during this conversation, when Zwingli was trying to explain his viewpoint, Luther is sitting there with his beer mug, because he was a German Lutheran, right? And he's pounding the table with his beer mug, going, this is my body, this is my body. You know, it's not just a symbol, it's not just a memorial. Jesus said, this is my body. Well, Jesus also said a lot of other literalistic sounding things. Uh, Jesus spoke in hyperbole. Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Uh, we're not going to get there. He didn't mean literally. Um, we're two or more gathered, I am there, you know, I am there in their midst. Well, he doesn't actually pop up like Jeep from the old Popeye cartoons. There's, you know, there, we have to be careful that we're not be too literalistic in this. Well, Luther didn't believe in transubstantiation. He didn't believe in Zwingli's memorialism. And this is before Calvin articulated it as the, reform, the proper reform position. So Luther came up with a doctrine of, of consubstantiation. He said that it doesn't literally change, but the presence of Christ is over, under, around, and through the elements. Martin? Waffle much? Um, I think that if what he meant was that the significance, if we come in faith that it has all the significance, that it is a real presence, although it doesn't change, that's what Calvin did a much better job of trying to explain later. And I think that's what, what Luther couldn't agree with transubstantiation, but he couldn't completely release it e anyway, either. So he came up with consubstantiation. Um, but again, this is, this is a major question. Is it really the body and blood of Christ? Is it only a symbol? Or is there something else happening in the middle? And that is that it doesn't change from being bread and wine, but all of the significance of it being the real body and blood of Christ is there if you have faith. Okay? Um, and fourth, the idea that the sacraments are seals, they are certifications or confirmations to us of the grace that is provided. Now again, it's not like medicine that gets, grace gets dispensed to us through the sacraments, but as we come to them in faith, we are recipients of the grace that our faith makes possible. And these are simply vehicles that we use for that celebration. Um, we understand about seals. If you have a passport, it's got the seal of the United States, which is embossed as a sign of the fact that, you know, you belong to something. You are a citizen. Um, Ernest Gabbard, he and, and Nelda got married recently, and as part of the marriage process, they went to the government offices and trying to file all the documents, and he said, I had my passport, I had two driver's licenses, I had my permanente card, I had my birth certificate, which had a, you know, an embossed seal on it from Iowa, and they wouldn't accept it because it didn't have a gold seal on it. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a process in Mexico, of an official, and so they said, you have to have a gold seal on your birth certificate. So we went back to, to Iowa and said, I need a gold seal. I said, we don't do gold seals. He said, I really need a, we don't do gold seals. So he had to go through a different process. He had attorneys in two countries trying to figure out how to deal with this. Well, that's, I mention all that because there's an idea that a seal means something. It implies something. It says you truly have been verified as being part 
of whatever it is, you know, that you really were a citizen of the United States, you really were born in Iowa on that day. It's a verification. Um, we have notary publics, and I'm not talking about notarios so much in Mexico because they have other responsibilities, but in the U.S., a notary public is someone who has taken an oath that they will always tell the truth and they're given an official seal, and when they put a seal on something, it is their testimony that this is what it's purported to be, that this really is true. Well, that's how the sacraments are seals for us. They are, they are indications that God's seal is on us, that we are one of his children then, that we are in fellowship with him. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, I want to talk about baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in a little more detail. Um, the sacrament of baptism. Again, Jesus himself was baptized, even though John the Baptist protested and said, you should be baptizing me rather than the other way around. But particularly, uh, it's in Matthew 28, before his, immediately before his ascension into heaven, that we have the command. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age, until the very end of the age. Go and do it. There is a command there. This is the first of the two Protestant Sacraments. It's also one of the Catholic, and, and it's a sacrament of every part of the Christian faith, except those who try to who deal with it only symbolically, you know, as, rather the, the, who don't see see using this as a form because they don't want to focus on the symbol; they want to focus on the reality of it. But um, there's a lot of controversy about this. Um, first, again. Baptism is commanded as a process for entry into the church, and that's an important way to see it, is that baptism is the, is, is the step we take in order to be admitted as members in the church um, and to be part of the family of God, to be part of the, the, those who are called to Christ. It's also, for adults, it is the act of witness and affirmation of our faith. But it is not required for salvation. Romans 10, 9, for instance. And people who will say, but it says, believe and be baptized. Well, the meaning of the word baptized, there's several meanings. There are two different words in the New Testament that we translate baptize. One of them means immerse. The other one means dip. But there are a lot of other places, both in the Bible and in other ancient documents in Greek, where baptize is much more commonly mean to become one with. You know, when you dip something in water, it's completely surrounded and, it became, and it's possible that it could dissolve. And so the idea of union is a better idea. So when he says um, baptize, some people think if you don't, uh, and I'll go down here, if you don't immerse, like Baptist for instance, they translate baptize only under the one, one word we use, which, mean, which does mean immerse. And they say, if you're not fully underwater, you're not really baptized. And many of those same people would say, if you're not really baptized, you're not really saved. We had, I've mentioned this before, we had a dear woman in our church, an older woman. She died a few years ago, but she was Dutch. And she was charismatic, and she was such a character. And um, Annette was her name. We had a couple of different baptisms, and after uh, one of them, a friend of hers was baptized as an adult who'd never been baptized before. And Annette came up to me and said, I would love to go to her and tell her congratulations, but she hasn't really been baptized. And I said, what do you mean, Annette? She said, you did not put her underwater, so therefore she is not really baptized. She was one of those, even though she wasn't Baptist, that she interpreted baptism by the one version of the word, which does mean immersion. You know, we've got several words that we translate uh, as baptized, just like we have words, multiple words we baptize by single words. Whenever you do translation, that's the process, is you have to make those decisions. So um, the, the belief is that the point is not immersing someone, but rather to go through a process whereby you acknowledge that they are being united with Christ, which is one of the more common understandings of the words we translate as baptized, to be united with, to be part of. Um, so whether you immerse them or sprinkle them, most Protestants would say it doesn't matter. You don't have to go all the way the water. And to be so literal about that probably also would indicate that someone does not have the right understanding of theologically what happens when you get baptized. 
people who say, well, if you're not completely immersed, then you're not saved. De facto, they believe that being baptized is what saves you. And that is not scriptural. And the reason it's not scriptural is because there are a lot of places in, there are places in the New Testament where it says believe and be baptized. And yet there are other places where it makes no mention of baptism when it talks about salvation. The, my favorite is Romans 10.9, which I have under that uh, first uh, bullet point up there. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in his, your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul makes no mention there of having to be baptized. Now, do you not think that when Paul was making as direct as clear a statement about how you get saved as that? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, and by the way, you also have to be baptized. No, he doesn't say that. If it were a requirement for salvation rather than just a command that we should fulfill in obedience, but not required for salvation, then it would be mentioned every time it talks about being saved. Is that fair? Anybody want to argue with me about that? I don't think Paul was so sloppy as to have left that out if it was really necessary for salvation. It doesn't mean that the places where it says believe and be baptized, etc. I think those are saying this is an important act of faithfulness that indicate that you accept and you can make personal testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ and to be part of the church, which is the body of Christ on earth. Now, what about infant baptism? Ooh, infant baptism. A lot of Protestant churches today believe only in believer's baptism. I've never have convinced my wife about this, by the way. Um, she came from a, a non-denominational Bible church background. In the Old Testament, when a baby boy was eight days old, he was circumcised. Um, circumscribed. If you're, if you're, a, he was circumcised to remove the foreskin of the male penis. And the reason was because that meant that for the rest of his life, every male who was part of the Jewish people would have a mark on his body that he was part of the people of God. In other words, from eight days old, he was officially acknowledged as being part of the family of God, the people of God. Now, he still had to grow up, and at some point in his growing up, he had to agree that he was going to live as a Jew that he was going to be obedient to the law, that he was going to, in the case of the Old Testament, he was going to participate in the sacrifices and in the various um, events that, that he was called upon to participate in, or he could just deny all that. Similarly, in the New Testament, we have examples where it says that whole families were baptized. Okay? The fathers accepted in faith and whole families were baptized. We don't have any specific examples where it says in infants were baptized. But in the same way that the circumcision was a symbol to the Old Testament, that that child was being welcomed into the family of God, but they still had to grow up and testify that, yes, they are going to be Jewish in terms of their practice. Infant baptism has, has always been accepted, from the, and the Reformers did this too. This was not just a Catholic thing. The Protestant Reformers did it. Only the Anabaptists came along uh, later and said, no, we only accept adult testimony and adult baptism. The idea has always been in the same way that circumcision was an, uh, an acknowledgement of entry into the people of God for the Jews. Infant baptism was a symbol of the fact that these infants were part of the body. They still have to grow up to the point of confirming that they really do believe this. But part of the ceremony of infant baptism, as we do it here and as almost all churches do, it's the testimony of the parents and of the congregation that they will raise the child in the Christian faith and that they will do all they can to nurture and affirm that child to the point where they can make their own choice. That's why infant baptism. And it has always been accepted until the Anabaptists and the movements that came off of that. Um, virtually all Christians at all time have accepted infant baptism as being a continuation of the same kind of symbolism and act that we had in circumcision. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yes? Well, and not the beginning of early church, but later on, did baptism, like in Catholicism, become the, the understanding that it became, this is salvation? It did become that in the Catholic Church. Um, at what point that began, I don't know. But the, the Reformers rebelled against that right. and said, no, this is not, you know, this is, this is not uh, something that saves you. It is something acknowledged that you're part of the body 
as a child, as your parents in the, in the community agree to raise you, but you still have to make the profession yourself or you're not saved. So, that, so the understanding is more or less that in the early church, it was, it was just, as you said, it's kind of like the church and the people and the parents are just saying, we will raise the child this way. Right. As opposed to actually, this gets me sick. Right, and there's also some cultural uh, differences <laughs> that are important. In the, in the time of Christ, and for a long time after that, in fact, this is true with a lot of countries that converted to Christianity, um, if, if the father of a family said, we're now going to believe, everybody in the family said, okay, and they did. And we can think that that's wrong or unfair or anything else, but they didn't have a problem with it. I mean, they did. That, that's what they did. Similarly, in later in Christian history, when a king or a ruler would decide to accept Christianity, all of a sudden, everybody in his, in his kingdom or his domain would all of a sudden become Christian. And they would go around and everybody would give their testimony of faith and everybody would be baptized. Because there was not this sense of individuality. There was a sense in which you accepted the, direct, the leadership of those appointed over you, whether they be parents or rulers. And if they said, this is the right thing to do, they would go, okay. Now, that hasn't always been a good idea. Um, Charlemagne, in 800, is... He did some wonderful things, but he also did some awful things. He was the first Christian ruler that really did use military force and violence to convert people to Christianity. You know, and he would conquer the local kings and then say, okay, now you have to order all of your people to become Christians, whether they want to be or not. So that was done by force. Uh, it'd be nice to say that Islam converted people by force, but Christianity didn't. It's not always been true. It's been kind of true most of the time. But, um, but still, we have to understand that historically when a father or his family said, yes, we are now going to be Christians. They didn't have a problem with that because he was seen as the one to lead them. And the same thing with rulers, etc. So the idea that, uh, oh, you can't baptize a baby until he gets old enough to make his own decision, that's a very, very recent idea. But still, the main point is, that doesn't say, the, the, a child who is not at the point of accountability, who's not able to decide good and evil, who's not able to decide for or against God, is not condemned anyway. By, Catholic, by Christian doctrine. Now, in Catholic doctrine, if they weren't baptized, then they, they were not saved. There was a special purgatory for babies and things like that. But um, Protestants have always said, even if we have infant baptism, <laughs> the point is that a child, until they reach the age of accountability, they're not liable to be condemned if they die anyway. And so there's really, it's not like baptism saves them. But at the point at which they have the ability to make the decision, they have to do so. But baptism was the sign that they were by the authority of their parents and with the agreement of the congregation or the church, they would be raised as part of the community of God. Okay? Yes? Two questions. One, many churches that believe in the believer's baptism mm -hmm. also have what they call an infant dedication, which is virtually very similar to infant baptism, just minus the water. Right. Can you comment on that? Well, I think what they've done is they've reversed the process. Instead of baptizing the infant and then having them confirmed later, they sort of confirm the infant as part of the community first, then they baptize them later. Okay. Um, and in that regard, again, unless you have a doctrine that you believe that baptism is somehow itself efficacious, meaning that it is the thing that saves you, then how is that any different? Okay. In other words, the, the idea of baptism as being a symbol consistent with circumcision, that you have a ceremony that marks this child as part of the, the family of God, unless they, later on, they still have to decide that they're committed to that. Um, is it, why is there fear about baptizing prior to somebody being able to make their, their profession of faith? Why not baptize them as an infant, and then when they get old enough, they're not going to be saved if they, have, if they decide against Christ? We're basically saying the same thing. If they're doing it because they, they have a problem with infant baptism, then I would say, well, is it because you have a, some idea about baptism that isn't biblical? Because usually it's not. That it somehow is efficacious. You have to be old enough to make a profession of faith before you're baptized. You're really, that's a new thing. That's a new idea. That started in the late 16th century with the Anabaptists. It did not exist for three quarters of the history of the Christian church. And there's no, there's no sense in which that was true in the New Testament. See what I mean? It's not that, that we have done something different. It's that those who do a, do a dedication to start with and then baptize later, they're the ones that came up with a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, why would they need to? Unless they think that baptism 
can only be done at a profession of faith, and that's not the historic understanding of it. <coughs> yes. So when uh, John the Baptist was baptizing people, uh -huh. there were children there who baptized? Or? No, not that I know of. Now, there, it's a different situation when they're just getting started. Um, I'm not saying that there's, in, that there's anything wrong. In fact, it's spectacular when an adult first makes a profession of faith, and because they hadn't been baptized as a child, they were baptized at that point. See, John, baptism was not, uh, in John's time, and prior to that, was not what we understood it to be. The Jews had a process where they would immerse themselves in water as a purification sign. Uh, in fact, they have found more and more and more as they've done excavations in and around Jerusalem. When they find the wealthier houses, they always have this bath mm -hmm. that has stairs that go down into it and then back out again. And people would go through, instead of just washing their hands like Muslims and some people do as a symbol of, uh, and, and they had in early Jewish time, that they would actually go down, walk down into this pool of water, and the water had to be flowing to be purified, and so there would be an inlet and an outtake of the water so that there's movement. They would walk into the water, that was a sign of, of being purified, especially before they had, you know, the Shabbat meal and before they did other holy things. So um, they would do that, and family members would do that, but understand that this being washed for purification in the Jewish faith was not exactly the way Paul, uh, John did it. John said just being a Jew isn't good enough. He was talking entirely to Jews, but he said you have to confess your sins and repent from your sins and commit yourself to God and live differently. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to prepare for the coming of the kingdom of God and the judgment that will come for those who are not being righteous, then I will, we'll do this ritual in the, in the Jordan River where we will wash you. So baptism was not the same thing then that it became later in the church. It had the same roots, but it was a different thing. Uh, John was saying, confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, commit yourself to living a righteous life. It was not a fa an idea of faith in Jesus Christ. And so... It was a different kind of thing. We have to be careful we don't carry that over too much. Later it became, baptism was a symbol for adults early on, that adults had confessed their faith in Jesus Christ, agreed to follow him, and they were baptized as a symbol they joined the church. Well, when they had children, those children were baptized as a symbol that they were part of the body as well and would be raised in that, but they had the choice later to say, I don't believe that really. Okay, and That was acceptable. Let's take a break. It's fine. Okay. Were there any last questions about the baptism issue or any of that? Yes. A few classes ago, we were talking about a group of women that wanted to baptize in their small group or whatever it was. Right. Okay. When I read Matthew 28, or when you read Matthew 28, you know, is this talking to every believer? Or is it just talking to specific people? Because in the in the instance with the women, and maybe it was because they were a part of the bigger church, they were sort of reprimanded because someone that was a minister needed to do that. But from what I'm reading here, that doesn't no. okay. allude to that. So help me. The story's all different than what you remember. Oh, okay. The point was they they wanted to keep it a secret. Oh, they didn't want okay. to tell anybody else. And the point was the church said that's fine. The church didn't reprimand them. I would have reprimanded. Oh. I would have stopped them, not reprimanded. Oh, but I've oh. told them that's no, okay. The two things they did that were wrong is one, they wanted to do it in secret. Okay. And baptism has always been seen adult baptism. I mean, any public, even infant baptism is done as a public event. Right, it's part right, of the, right. it's a corporate thing. They wanted to keep it a secret, and secondly, they had no process by which anybody, this is go and make disciples and baptize them. <clears throat> there was no sense in which anybody who knew anything about what it meant to be a disciple was talking with them. They had not gone through any classes. As I say, as far as we know, half of those women might have been thought that they were being dipped in water as a way to acknowledge that God and the earth goddess Gaia was blessing. So the fact that they wanted to do it completely outside any kind of instruction, okay. yeah, it was just a, it was just a women's fellowship group, and I don't know that there was anybody. There may have been, but there was no indication to me the way they described it that anybody in that group 
had any position of training or authority or anything else in order to make sure that they knew what they were doing. That was one problem. They weren't, there was no indication they had been made disciples. And secondly, the fact they, they insisted on doing it in private mm -hmm. means it was not what baptism okay, yes, is. I, I did meant, I understood they were doing it separate, but I didn't understand they were doing it in secret. Yeah, they, exactly. They mm -hmm. didn't want to tell anybody. And they said, is it okay if we don't tell anybody that we're baptizing each other? Um, and I'm going, wow. That's, that's not what baptism is. Okay, so according to this, uh, anyone that disciples someone can baptize them? Yes, I think I, I have no problem with that. Now, I don't know why they would need to, because again, if you're discipling somebody and you, you, you baptize them, there are times in which somebody has an expression of faith, they've never been baptized, and I'm thinking Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. Philip didn't say, well, come back with me to Jerusalem, and we'll talk to these guys, and then we'll, we'll make it a public event. The Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe, is there any reason I can't go ahead and be baptized? Here's some water. And Philip said, no, let's get, get out of your chariot and let's do it right here. So there would be times in which that was appropriate. But, you know, Philip had just made a point of explaining the gospel to him, you know, and he accepted. He, he had created a disciple by explaining it to him. Um, now, apart from some extraordinary circumstance like you meet up with an Ethiopian eunuch and he's on a chariot somewhere, uh, in most cases it would be better to do it as part of the body because it becomes a corporate event, which is part of what baptism being a bringing of somebody into the, the family of, of God, into the body of Christ, as part of the community of Christ, then it would be better to do it there, but there's no rule against that. Okay? And we have a specific example where that happened. Yes, ma'am. I had an incident where I felt uncomfortable, but I did feel um, that it was a very special time. I used to work in hospice, and a person who was dying, of course, they were there in the hospice, uh, had had some discussions with me about uh, moving on in life and had some revelations about the being in God and the belief in God. And, he asked me to read some Bible passages that uh, were about Jesus and the work of Jesus. And then his family was coming in, etc., to visit him all the time. And we were a small institution, so we were small staff, like three or four a day. And um, then he said, do you think I could have this baptism? so that I will know that I have a, um, a relationship with God. And at that point, I didn't know that it would be correct to or incorrect or not. So I said to him, yes, I think you can be uh, making a declaration of faith in God and asking for a relationship. <coughs> Through Jesus, and I would be honored to help you uh, with that. And so, with you know, a couple of staff members and his couple of family members here and there, um, we baptized him in, um, by reading of the scriptures uh, and with just acting with the sign of the cross on his forehead with yeah. water. And he died. Um, the next day or very shortly afterwards. Right. I didn't see him again, is, yeah. the, is the point. And I've always wondered, was that a, a just thing, a correct thing for them or for me? Or Right. Well, I don't, the issue there, and this is always the issue, you know, when it says go and make disciples, it means disciples in Jesus Christ. And so the issue there is if he just, if his statement was, was too generic, like, well, I want to be in a relationship with God, then our response needs to be, well, the only way you can come into a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ and believing in Him. And if that was the case, yes, that, then, that was the case. then that's a circumstance, a very appropriate circumstance, where somebody who is bedridden in the point of death, and in fact, that's what the Catholic Church with the, yeah. does with extreme unction. You know, the, the, um, the, the idea of baptism has been really messed up and misinterpreted uh, for a long, long time. In fact, there was a period of time in the Catholic Church when they had the sacraments so messed up that people would intentionally not be baptized until the moment of death because they thought baptism, baptism was what washed away their sins, and so they wanted to get all their sins behind them as much as they could before they got baptized. Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, the one who made Christianity illegal, was not baptized until he was on his deathbed. 
Um, so you, you, we've had some weird ideas about that. But I think in a situation where somebody is bedridden, particularly if they're at the point of death, if they make a profession in Jesus Christ, not just, you know, I want to be right with God, that's not enough. But, and I'm not saying that's what you said, but if that were the case, then that's not sufficient. In fact, we would be falsely assuring them if, if, if they're not willing, if they don't understand, they're not willing to accept Jesus as their Savior. If they are willing to do that, then I think it's very appropriate that we give them the assurance. Again, not like they're not saved if you don't baptize them, but giving them the, the assurance, the reassurance of that their commitment is a real one by baptism, I think was, very, was absolutely right. As long as their confession was correct, that they really had become a disciple of Jesus, then baptizing them in that situation was a good thing. Okay? Well, I did hear that that individual, uh, he had some problems in his family, that we all with relationships, and he did forgive and straighten out, good. literally on his deathbed, the misunderstandings of all the problems that were having with the child. Right. And um, that the family came to me sometimes afterwards and said, you know, that was the most profound thing that could have happened to them and they were sorry to see dad die of course. Right. But they were glad it was in that circumstance. Right. Which is good. Again, the thing we all we have to be cautious of is that we don't give people false assurance. Mm -hmm. That we don't suggest to them if they've not really made a profession in Jesus Christ, we don't leave them feeling like, well now they're okay. I mean that's people who come to us and want us to baptize their babies. They don't go to church, they don't really have an expression of faith, they want to baptize their babies because they think it's magic, or they think it's medicine, or they think then my baby will be okay. Well, the same thing is true with the older person. If they don't really make a professional faith, but they want to be baptized because that somehow they think will make them better, or okay, or you know, get them past the hump, or whatever it is, we're just giving false assurance unless we're very clear to them that this means that you are accepting that Jesus died on your behalf, that your sins are forgiven because you received the atonement payment that he made for you and that he truly is your savior and your lord i mean if that's the agreement we're good but if it's something more generic than that then the fe my fear is that we give people false assurance and that's almost worse and we can say well who doesn't want to make somebody else feel better well that could keep them from making the hard decision that they need to make uh, for jesus okay so we have to be careful all right let's talk about the sacrament of the lord's supper the second of the sacraments we accept now um, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is referred to in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where the story is given of Jesus blessing the elements and telling the, the, his disciples to uh, do this in remembrance of me. But the best description of it is actually the, the story is told by Paul in 1 Corinthians when he is trying to, clear, to clean up uh, the fact that the Corinthian church was doing it wrong. They were doing communion wrong. They were... They were making it out as a feast in which some people got to eat and some people didn't and there was gluttony involved and all sorts of things. So he tells the story in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 of how Jesus did it. And it's our best example of the commissioning of the Lord's Supper when he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. There's the command part. In the same way also at the cup after supper, um, I'm sorry, it should be the same way also he took the cup uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is the institution, the words of institution, the first words of institution for the Lord's Supper. Every time we bless the elements now for the Lord's Supper, it's called the words of institution. Uh, in, in we use these words uh, in terms of the blessing of first the bread and then of the cup. Now, whereas baptism is the initiatory sacrament, meaning it is the first one that, that brings people into the body of Christ, that, that that's their process or invitation, the ceremony that by which they become part of the body, the Lord's Supper is a continuing sacrament. You only get baptized once, as we were just saying. But the Lord's Supper is a continuing sacrament and to be observed again and again through the Christian life so that it has past, present, and future significance. You will remember we've talked about the fact that worship is significantly both remembrance and anticipation, right? 
So the Lord's Supper is a recognition of a past event, the fact that Jesus Christ died as an atoning sacrifice for us. He made us right with God by paying the price for our sins. We remember the specifics of how he did that and the words he used in preparation for that when he said, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood poured out for you. So we are remembering. There is the present sense of this in which as we do this act, this participation in the sacrament of communion, we are reaffirming our own faith and by our faith we are receiving grace. Not because it's magic, but because as we come to these elements, believing them to be, uh, to have all of the significance of the body and blood of Christ, not literally changed, but having that significance and to recognize what he did for us in taking these elements, we do receive grace now. That's the present part. We also talk about, we celebrate this until he comes again. The promise that the resurrected Christ will be returning. So there is the, and the remembrance of things past, the participation in the grace God provides us presently, and the anticipation of what is to come in the future. All of those things are present in the Lord's Supper and communion. And that's, that's why we continue to enact this. Some churches do it every time they meet or every week. Some churches do it, you know, Baptist, Southern Baptist Church I used to go do would do it the fifth Sunday of every month, which means once a quarter. There's one, one month out of every three, you have five Sundays. Um, our church, we do it the first Sunday of every month, and I'm thinking of kicking that up, maybe doing the first and third Sundays of every month. Because I do think there is, there is significance in that. There is power in the taking of that, and I would like to do more with it than I do now, because uh, sort of it almost is an add-on in some cases. The, my preaching mentor, the, Ian Pitt Watson, who was the best preacher I ever heard, he was a Scottish uh, preacher, was my preaching teacher, and he once said a beautiful thing. He said, you know, when I preach a sermon, I have to decide what is my focus going to be. I have to decide, am I preaching the grief and the mourning of Good Friday, or am I preaching the celebration and joy of Easter morning, in effect? I mean, whether it's Easter or not, you still have to pick a... Pick a route. You know, where are you going to go with your sermon? And he said, invariably, no matter what I choose, I'm going to miss somebody that's in the congregation. I'm going to preach, you know, the grief of our sinfulness, and somebody's going to be, you know, on the mountaintop of the joy in, in the Lord. Or I'm going to preach the mountaintop of joy in the Lord, and somebody's going to be in the dark night of the soul. And I'm always going to miss somebody. But the Lord's table touches everyone, no matter where they are. Because if they, for instance, if if they are in the dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross called it, if they are in you know, a sense of their own sinfulness and of the need for grace, they are remembering what Christ did for them that made it possible for them to be forgiven. And it touches them there. If they are the joy of you know, the glory of the resurrection and of, of the anticipation of glory with Him forever, they can look forward with anticipation to the fact that this will be fulfilled in the coming of Christ. No matter where they are, the sermon's going to miss somebody, but the communion table, the Lord's table, is always going to touch them wherever they are. So there's real power in that. I've never forgotten when Ian told me that. Um, so that idea that it is past, it is present, it is future for us, and it touches us wherever we are at that moment, makes it very, very powerful. Um, and at the heart of the Lord's Supper is our communion or fellowship with Christ, which is why we refer to it as the communion service. We are in communion. Again, worship, worship is, is God's invitation to us, our response to be in communion with Him. Well, what better part of the worship service for us to feel the communion of the Lord than when we are participating in the communion table? That's why this is so powerful. Okay? And I've already talked a little bit about the fact that the question has always been there about the nature of Christ's presence. We say that He is present in the elements of communion. Is it a memorial that he's not actually there any more than he's there with us in any time we seek him uh, in a spiritual sense? A memorial that Zwingli and some of the Anabaptists and others said, or literal body and blood, as the Catholic Church says in transubstantiation, or is it a spiritual reality, as Calvin articulated, that he is real, it is the real presence of Christ, but that is in a spiritual sense, even though it's still bread and wine, or bread, bread and juice, or bread and cup. Um, the, there's a, still a great deal of difference in terms of that. Um, 
Any questions about that? Mm. Yes? Well, it's about uh, baptism. I miss it. What about uh, women not receiving, women uh, making me baptized as a minister? Women uh, offering the sacraments? Yeah. Absolutely, <coughs> yes. Um, I believe that there is strong witness in Scripture that women are called to that, if they are called to that, that they should be involved in ministry as well. Um, people say Paul was anti-women, and that Paul said women needed to be quiet. Actually, Paul was a great liberator of women. It was Paul who said there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. There's no difference in Christ. People say, well, Paul said I want women to be silent in the church. A better translation of that, and it's in 1 Corinthians, um, would be, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, would be that Paul said, I want women to be calm in the church. It apparently was the case that some women in Corinth were creating a problem because they were coming into the church and they were interrupting the service and asking questions and everything else. And Paul said, if you've got questions, save them and ask your husband at home, but don't interrupt the service. Stay calm. And the reason I'm confident in saying that's what he meant is because earlier in that same book, he says in 2 Corinthians, women, when you prophesy or testify in the service, you should have your head covered. Now, prophecy is the highest of all the spiritual gifts. It's what is being exercised when somebody preaches rightly. Um, Paul, in effect, was saying women have authority to do the most authoritative thing that can happen in a church service. He said, cover your head. Well, the very that was a cultural thing. Very simply, any woman who cut her hair or did not cover her head in public was a prostitute in those days. And Corinth had a real problem with that. The Temple of Aphrodite was on the Acropolis in Corinth, and they said at one point as many as a thousand prostitutes, temple prostitutes from the Temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, would wander the streets of Corinth inviting men to come and worship with them. Okay? And so the issue of being mistaken for a prostitute was a big deal back then. And for the sake of propriety, for the sake, and this was cultural propriety as well as religious propriety, simply to make sure that people didn't misunderstand and think you were a woman of, of low reputation, don't, don't fly in the face of cultural convention, cover your head when you're in public. And that includes when you were involved in public worship services. <clears throat> But the point is, the main point is, that Paul is saying women prophesy and give testimony in the church service. And so in that same book when he says later, women should be calm in the church, and some translations say should be quiet or silent in the church, he's talking about women who were disrupting things. If it had been, as I've said before, if it had been one-legged, red-headed orphans from Madagascar who were creating the problem, then he would have said, I don't want one-legged, red-headed orphans from Madagascar to be causing a problem in the, service. You, in the service. You need to be calm in the service. It wasn't a sex, a gender discrimination at all. Paul, in many ways, Paul acknowledges women as being co-partners in the ministry. At one point, he says that Junius, which is a woman's name, was recognized among the uh, as, a, as a leader of the gospel among the apostles. Now, we're not clear on whether he was saying that she might have been considered an apostle or whether she was held in high regard by all of the other apostles. Either way, there's, that's the highest credit he could give anybody, and he gave it to a woman. So over and over and over again in Paul's writings, he is actually very affirming of women in ministry. So to say that Paul is saying, now, now it was cultural back then, that most of the leadership positions went to men. That's just the way the world was then. I don't think that there's, there's some universal truth to be drawn from that. And Paul, both Paul and Jesus were great liberators of women. Yes? Well, wasn't Jesus' mother, Mary, um, kind of a head or a leader or certainly one of the people that was moving forward? Well, she was part of it. In terms of when Jesus was alive, there were a group of women that were the primary supporters of Jesus. In fact, the indication is that they're the ones who were providing the financing uh, for one, the, the, um, the wife of one of the major Roman officials, or at least the, the, the man that was a major leader in the Roman households. She was part of the Christian body. 
Um, there were a number of women of significant, you know, of significant position who were supporters of the early Christian church, and the, and the indication is that they provided the money. They were, so, they were funding the thing. Um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, clearly. I don't know of any record where she, like in the book of Acts, where she took a major role. She obviously had a voice because Luke, when Luke starts his gospel, he says, I am putting together a more orderly account of all of this for your sake, my dear Theophilus. He's writing it to perhaps a patron. Um, and he says, because I've talked to all these people. And Luke is the one who says, when Mary heard the things about Jesus, her son, she stored up all these things and treasured them in her heart. And you're going, well, how would Luke know that unless he talked to Mary? Nobody else would have known that Mary, what Mary was thinking except Mary. And so clearly she was there. Clearly she had a voice. People were talking to her. Um, we don't have any other record, unless I'm forgetting something, of her having a, a significant leadership role, but she clearly was there. Uh, Mary Magdalene was present with them. Um, there are other women who, who are identified by name. And we even miss the fact that, like when Paul, when he was writing his letters, or when we meant, they mentioned the women who were involved around Jesus, the very fact that you would mention a woman by name was not common in those days. When Paul writes letters and said, please give my greeting to, and he lists almost as many women as he does men, that in itself is a statement of the equality that he took, that he held men and women in. Okay? So people have a completely wrong idea about Jesus and about Paul. We had, I've told this story, I'm sure. Carolyn and I had uh, three couples to dinner one night, two years ago or something, two couples we knew, and then one of the couples had invited another couple that were a friend of theirs. And we didn't know them, they clearly were not Christian from some of the things they said. At one point in the conversation, uh, I don't know, I don't know, don't remember exactly how I got mentioned, but somebody said something about um, Paul, or I said something about Paul in response to a question somebody had, and the woman who's part of this couple we did not know, she said, oh, Paul hated women. And I said, actually, that's not true. And I gave her some of the same examples I've just given you, you know, no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. And I said, in point of fact, Paul was a great liberator of Given his culture, where he was, the time he was, it was extraordinary how much credit he gave to women. And she was like, you know, uh, did not quite know how to respond to that. But it's because she was simply repeating something somebody had said to her one time that she thought sounded, you know, right or cool or everybody thought this. And in fact, it's not true. Okay, I believe women should be involved in ministry. I do not agree with the church that do not allow women in writing ministry. In fact, one of the reasons that we are not part of we, being Lakeside Presbyterian Church, um, we are not part of any other denomination. We, uh, most of the people who founded our church came out of the Presbyterian Church USA in, in the States. We don't agree with a lot of the things that PCUSA has done in recent months and years. Uh, and so that would be a problem anyway. But PCUSA was thrown out of Mexico a number of years ago. And so we can't, we couldn't even if we wanted to belong to PCUSA. Um, here in Mexico, the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico is the largest Presbyterian body, but they have modeled themselves on the Presbyterian Church of America, the smaller, much more conservative branch of Presbyterianism in the U.S., which, among other things, does not allow women in positions of leadership of any kind. The National Presbyterian Church of Mexico not only doesn't have women ministers, but women cannot be elders, or I don't think they can be deacons even. Uh, so no position of leadership at all. I don't believe that's biblical. We don't believe that's biblical. And so our option was... We are independent. Technically, we are our own denomination because we, we are registered as an association religioso, which means a church in, with the government of Mexico. But then we took the next step and registered as an instituto. Instituto basically means, with regard to a church, we are a denomination. And so we have registration as our own denomination in Mexico, which is why we have the authority to um, ordain people and award degrees and whatever else. But we don't take that lightly and we don't abuse that. But we... One of the reasons is because we believe in women in leadership. We have women elders, we have women deacons. I would be pleased as punch if at some point the right woman would come along as a candidate for a ministerial position in our church. Is that direct enough? Okay, are we good? And, you, and I've explained why we believe that. It's not just because we think that's better. I believe scripture tells us that. Lynn. A very interesting point just to make your story seem really good is that um, many years ago our United Church of Canada offered um, a winter session of education for public or whoever wished to come. 
and they had um, people from Queen's University School of Theology come and present the lectures, and it was like five lectures or something. And the best attended and most amazing were the, we had a session, the 12 lectures, on Pauline studies presented by Roman Catholic men. Mm -hmm. And ministers from other churches, et cetera, came to hear her, to see what she had to say. Yep. Because they had, even ministers of other churches had this narrow concept of Paul not liking women, uh, right. you know, he never married, so he didn't like women, and, uh, and all sorts of goofy ideas. And when they left those classes, uh, the discussions, I mean, we were out in parking lots in sub-zero weather talking because they just were so filled with this marvelous Good. new revelation okay. and delivered by a woman from, uh, 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 in quotes, a narrow faith, a Catholic faith. Right. Uh, it was really amazing to yeah. see it happen. It's, there are too many churches that I don't think have a proper biblical understanding of what Scripture really says. Um, anyway. Any questions about that or anything else we've talked about? This is the last point I really wanted to make today. Yes, Joanne. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm really clear on the baptism, non-baptism of a baby's small mm -hmm. children in terms of when It doesn't have anything to do with coming from a Christian home. And an infant, I, you know, God is a God of mercy. God does not judge um, judge harshly in, in circumstances where people don't have any authority. In fact, and I base that some on the first chapter of Romans, where it seems to say that those who have the who are under the law, who have the law, will be judged by the law. And I think I read that as saying that those who do not have the opportunity for receipt of grace will be evaluated and judged based upon the grace they have, you know, how obedient. Uh, C.S. Lewis reflects that in the Chronicles of Narnia when this, there's the Calamine soldier who uh, has always worshipped Tosh, which is the Calamine god, which Lewis very intentionally intended to be a reflection of, uh, of the Islamic god, you know, of Allah. And he finds that, this fellow finds out at one point, he meets Aslan, who is the, the, the Christ symbol. And the soldier says, but I've always worshipped Tosh. And Aslan said, well, when you worship Tosh, you are actually worshipping me. And what he meant by that, Lewis was not trying to say all religions are the same. What he meant is, because this soldier, and the soldier actually sacrifices his life in service to his God, you know, willingly. Um, Lewis was making the point that, that even if somebody, because of their upbringing, has the wrong name, and this is what I think Romans 1 is saying, if they are committed to serving God as they understand Him to be, and they do it with whole heart and with their whole spirit, if they've never really been given the opportunity to know the name of Jesus, or of Aslan, in the case of the last battle in Chronicles of Narnia, then their faith really is in the one true God. And so, and God is not unfair about that. Now, that's a long way of getting to your point. If a child is not, uh, has not matured to the point that they are able to make the decision in favor of or against mm -hmm. Jesus, God is not going to condemn them. God is not going to judge them. There's never been, uh, well, there has been some, uh, but in terms of small children especially, uh, Christianity does not advocate that they will be condemned. Now, the Catholic Church has said that if a child is you know, dies without being baptized, then there is a special place in purgatory for them. Okay, which is not the same as saying they think they're going to go to hell. Well, we don't believe that either, because we don't believe in purgatory, for one thing. If a child has never reached the age of accountability, and we call it, call it accountability because that's the age at which they are able to decide truly, right from wrong, in terms of moral, and when they are old enough to decide either for or against God and Jesus, when they can either say yes to Jesus or no to Jesus. Until they reach that age, which we call the age of accountability, when they can be held accountable for their decisions, then I absolutely believe they are in the hands of a merciful God and that they will not be condemned, no matter whether they came from a drug, drug addict home or whether they came from a Christian home. That's not an issue. God is not a, a merciless God. Rather, He is a God of love and mercy. He's also a God of justice, but the justice doesn't kick in until you're old enough to know what justice is. And so that's why we believe that. Is that fair? Yeah, so don't, that's not an issue. 
And if you hear somebody say that, they must be coming from a Catholic, kind of a Catholic perspective, or, or some other kind of wacky perspective, because there are some strange ones out there. Other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, why, uh, when Paul says, to the women be silent, he doesn't specify the women who are uh, being too, too who are making noise or talking too much? Actually, he does. He says, women, and the translation, women be silent in church, is, I believe, a bad translation. I believe a better translation is, um, I want women to be, to be calm in the church. Oh. And he says, if you have a question, wait and ask your husbands at home. If you look it up, it's in 2 Corinthians. That's the same letter, as I was just saying a minute ago, in which Paul gives women permission, in fact, acknowledges the fact that they are prophesying and testifying in the church service, which is prophecy being the highest of all spiritual gifts that can be expressed. So I believe clearly Paul would not, in the same letter, say women need to be absolutely quiet in the church and then acknowledge them as, as being appropriately prophesying and testifying in church. You know, mm -hmm. the, that, what's sometimes translated be silent, has to mean something different, and I think that's a bad translation of it. And the indication is that they were being disruptive. And it was women who were being disruptive, which is why he says, I want the women to be calm in church because you're creating a ruckus. The likely reason that historians believe is that Corinth had a number of other pagan temples, not just the Temple of Aphrodite. There was right in the middle of town, the, there was a Temple of Zeus and others. Women often, especially in Aphrodite and some of the others, they were priestesses. They were the religious leaders. And the suggestion is that some of these women would become Christians, but they were used to being in charge. And so they would come into the situation, into services, into the church, and they would create a problem because they were getting really pushy and aggressive and asking questions and challenging the authority that was going on, whatever. And so that's why they were an issue. But I don't think Paul is telling them just to be silent in church. Okay. Yes. If, yes. If they didn't have formal church structures at that. At Not buildings. Time. No. no. So if they were in catacombs or those kinds of places, you have uh, a disruption. Uh, what it would be a disruptive child uh, is really a huge noticeable thing if you've ever been down there. Mm -hmm. Like sounds echo, or they're amplified. They're Right. You know, so he was making a really big statement, uh, um, but a very necessary statement, just for the logistics of, of worship. Yeah, well, uh, the very practical, you, you could be right, but the very practical part of if we're having a worship service and I've got, and Canadians start making a ruckus, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, I don't want Canadians to be interrupting the service. <laughs> or if, you know, if... Whatever. I don't think you have to worry. Or Mexicans, or, you know, or Lutherans, or, you know, pick a category of whatever. If they are being disruptive, then it might be necessary to say, whoa, whoa, Lutherans, calm down. All right? I think we need to understand his comments that way. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you pick up your study notes. If anybody has any questions, there's only like 35 questions and answers on there. And as I've said, as I said before, or at the last class, if you read this and it seems awfully complicated, it's the same thing I said in the last class, so if you need to take your call, go ahead. Um, his phone was just going off. Um, this is intended for two reasons. One, for people who want to study it for taking the test. But in addition to that, this is kind of a summary of the important things that we said in the class, so that it's, a, it's something that will help you remember what we've talked about. Whether you're taking the test or not, take one of the sheets, that, you know, read it, study it. If you are taking the test and you're looking at all the detail on this, do not panic. Because this is intended for an overall view, but the test is a multiple choice test. So even if you're taking the test, you only have to know this well enough to recognize it. You don't have to know it well enough. There's no fill in the blank. There's no essay questions. So you only have to know it well enough to be able to recognize it to check a box. And and I usually, in the questions, I don't have a lot of detail, unless they're just sort of filling in so that that'll help you recognize it. So don't be bothered by that. As I said in the last class, I don't think anybody's ever accused me of being unfair in how, how I do the test. So don't panic. If this looks like too much detail, I encourage you to study it. I encourage you to take the test. Next week, we will have an hour of, lux of lecture, and then we will take the test. Okay? Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. <laughs>